Hi, and welcome to Mondays with Marlo. Today our guest is Brooke Shields. I ran into Brooks at Brooks Brothers, as a matter of fact, and, and just corralled her and said, oh, please, please, please come on Mondays with Marlo, because I, I knew you'd all love to talk to her. And by these uh, millions of questions, they obviously do really want to well, talk to you. Well, thank you. I'm glad you corralled me. <laughs> well, you're very inspiring. I mean, you were so beautiful as a little girl, and then as a young woman, and as a grown woman. But you never got into that, my looks were enough thing. Oh. You went to Princeton. You made a life for yourself thank outside you. of beauty. And you can have the beauty anytime you want. But you really made it about being a good person and a strong oh, person and a smart that. person. Thank and you. You know, as a, I'm a mom, and that you know, as you've got these, I've got these two little girls, and they are very, you know, it's all around us to focus on the outside. And I've always been saying, you know, beauty is always only as good as you are, smart and strong and confident. And so I made sure that because I was in a quote unquote beauty business, to make sure that I had a life that really was, you know, founded in something more substantial. Right. No, that's great. <laughs> I mean, not everybody comes out of that experience with that attitude. They come, kind of get stuck there and they well, never really move on. It's hard to, I, th I think, I mean, and this is something I talk to my kids a lot about, that there is, it's, it's hard not to because it is so celebrated. Uh -huh. So, you know, if you're the pretty girl, you get the attention, right. you get the quote unquote approval. Right. And to that, and it gets addict, you're, it can be addicting. It is, of course. And you then start to think that it's the part of your whole personality that precedes you. And in a way it does, because that's what we seem to be very right, focused on right, and motivated by, right. especially in this country. And so to, I, I see how it happens all the time. Right. I see the preoccupation with, right, with it. And right. it's, it's just a struggle and you have to be surrounded by people too that constantly say to you, you know, it's not all there is. It's not all there is. And you have so much many other values. That's the big thing. It's the first thing to go. Right. <laughs> no, not yet. Okay, this is from Bella. I know you've been married twice. Hi, Bella. Welcome. <gasps> Don't tell my husband. <laughs> I'm about to be married for the second time. What did you learn from your first marriage that you didn't take into your second marriage? So you know, I, I, my marriage is, uh, my first one was a very um, important, for, important one for me to sort of become individualized um, as a person from my mother and from my from my life so I there was a lot of confidence that I needed to gain and I ended up being able to do that through my first husband and because of him he helped me a lot but my second marriage whereas my my husband likes to say my current marriage <laughs> because I'm not sure at any time with you you may just which is good Bella for your second husband because you kind of keep them a little on their toes because they know you know that's possible um, and but it, what I've brought into it is just a sense of my own self mm -hmm. and the the not trying to be anybody else, uh -huh. not trying to be this ideal of what I think I should be, but really sort of at this point, by the time I got to my second husband, <laughs> I said sort of, this is all I've got. This is me. I'm working on myself constantly, but this, this is it. Is it. Right. And, and there was no, you know, there was no fantasy involved right. with that. And I think that being realistic about what a marriage is, is much easier to do the second yeah. time. Yeah, that's, no, I think that's right. Yeah. I've, I've only been married once, but my husband's been married twice. And I think, you know, he did bring things to this marriage, which was an experience. Well, how do you do it and how do you do, not do it? And also to appreciate certain things. I think sometimes you got to get some of the kinks out. Right, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, I would, I, you hope that it's not, right. you hope it's forever and right. you want it. And I've got, again, two little girls that I hope, <laughs> you know, it is because that's the fantasy and the dream. Um, but it is, there's a sense of maturity that has come with. Right. And also, but still being open enough and excited enough to feel this, th that it's special, to yes. not be jaded about it. I right. mean, to be able to say, I'm going to fall in love again and I'm going to take that step again is also, and trust yeah. and not be jaded about it right. is really important. Keeping your heart open, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Good luck, this, Bella. <laughs> <laughs> this is from Sarah. I read that you once said you didn't lose your virginity until you were 22 and it was because you didn't like the way you look. Can that be true? There, but Sarah, there's a lot of truth to that. Um, part of my issue, <laughs> one of my many issues, <laughs> I should say, was that I was, um, it was, I was a public figure, and so there was a very, there's a lot of responsibility for me at that young age because I was celebrated as a virgin, and and um, 
I wrote it in a book. I don't, it was not a very good idea for me to write that in the book. However, I did. It was done. It was in print. It was forever. <laughs> so you're um, stuck with it. So I was stuck with it. So then there was a responsibility to that. Um, I will say that the part about not liking my looks is that I was very insecure with myself physically, um, especially my body, uh, because as we've talked about, basically my whole life I was sort of from the neck up. I was celebrated as a cover girl or I was, and so there was, that was the focus. And I never did runway um, because I wasn't skinny enough, um, which is sort of pathetic, uh, but completely. that's what I was told. And um, well, you have to take heroin to be that skinny anyway. Exactly, so. and I wouldn't have even known how to <laughs> take heroin, and I still would not know. But, uh, but so there was a definite insecurity um, and just a, a fear of that I wasn't kind of good enough. And then, you Amazing. know, just a fear. You know, it's amazing for a woman as beautiful as you are and have always been that there was any ever insecurity about your looks. I mean, it really says something to all of us. I mean, in a way, it kind of makes you feel better, like you think this woman had that problem. So, you know, I feel like it's a, it's become sort of a cliche now that yeah. we say, oh, I was the ugly duckling. You hear right. people say that. But I think it's deeper than that. I think it's that we are taught to compare ourselves right. constantly. Compare, be that person. Oh, she's got that, I want that. Right, right. Oh, that's, that's considered good, that's tall, that's skinny, that's right, fat, yeah. that's tall, short. And so what happens is very rarely does the focus initially come on to us as women. You right. know, and we're always trying to be something that right. we aren't instead of celebrating or really feeling confident with what we have. We always want what we don't have. Right. And so we nurture that mm -hmm. with advertisements. And, right. and listen, I'm a, I am a person who's in those ads. Right, so I, right. I'm as guilty. And yet it's, you know, again, as a mom, you try to say to yourself, right. let's try to find how right. we're unique. Right. And let's try to not covet what we don't have. Right. But it's years. I'm mean, 47. I so know, it's like right. now I'm figuring it out. But that's, hey, some people some, never do. Right, better late than to never. be able to say about yourself, this is it, and hey, guess what? This is good enough. This is just good enough, whatever and, it is. And that, I think that's huge. And you see people that say don't traditionally have what we label as um, a perfect figure, but they walk around with such confidence yes. that before you know it, they're the, gourd, the best that's, thing the ever. One. And then we celebrate that. So there is something to be said for, um, for promoting that type that of inner. belief. And also in saying, like, she walks around. My mother used to say um, that there was just one actress, and, you know, she was kind of ample bottom. And, and she said, are you kidding? She walks into a room, and she looks at her butt and thinks it's the best thing in the world. And you walk in, and by the, by the end of the party, you're going, God, she looks gorgeous with that shapely figure, you right, know? Yes. It's how you carry it's yourself. It's how she carries it. That's great. This is from Elena. As a mother of daughters, how do you feel now looking back on the strong sexual content of those Calvin Klein ads and and the movie Pretty Baby you did when you were so young, would you let your daughters do that? It's a really good question. I there's it's a, there's a few answers. I never felt compromised when I was that age mm -hmm. because to me there was this we were doing artistic we were doing little movies for the right, Calvin Klein. Right. When I did Pretty Baby, I had a body double, and I was on a set in New Orleans where Sven Nyqvist, right. Louis Malle, like we were, these were real artists. Right, so you were. never, there was nothing sordid about right, it. Right. Um, the flip side is, if there's at any given, I mean, my children, my nine-year-old walks around naked all the time, <laughs> right. the doors open in the bathroom, and I'm the one trying to tell her, right. please, you've got to think of privacy right, a little right. bit. Um, I think the rules have gotten different. I think the, um, the the sort of sexuality that's infused in all of our advertising now has gotten much worse, right. more intense. Right. Um, I think there's less protection for kids. Mm -hmm. I don't think my kids, w I wouldn't let them do it because I think the world is a very different place. Uh -huh. You know, I, I don't, I would feel compromised. Uh -huh. I would feel compromised now. Right. E even if I, if anybody wanted to see my body um, <laughs> without any clothes on, um, beside my husband. But, you know, I, I think yeah. that it's a different, I probably wouldn't let them, but also we're in a different era and yeah. I have very different children. We're growing up in a very different right. place. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And also you did that, so you kind of know what that was like and you Well, there was a freedom yeah. to it and, I, and, and a freedom in doing it. But it wasn't, um, I, don't, I don't think you're as safe now with the same freedom. I, I, I get it. I, I know what you mean. This is from Lisa. You were hilarious when you did an episode of Friends. 
you also you had that other uh, your own show too. Suddenly, Susan. Yes, that was yep. a comedy as well. Yep. Four years. Yeah. So and Lisa time. wants to know if you're going to be doing any more comedies. <laughs> I would love it. Yeah. I to me, it is the best. It is the most joyous way of spending my day. Uh -huh. And if I could do it every day, I'm trying. We're trying to get a show. Um, to get picked up and it's all that those seasons are, are coming now where we try to pitch right. shows and yeah. stuff and I'm constantly trying to get on another show like that just because it's oh, it's so fun to spend your day like that it's, it's so, so fun. nice it's so fun. Uh, this is from Tracy hi Brooke you look great what are your tips for staying youthful after 40 I'd love to hear them you are so youthful looking. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Hmm, thank you. Uh, I, a lot has to do, and again, it feels like a Hallmark card, a lot of it has to do with youthful, uh, feeling youthful. Um, not getting into the rut of, oh, I'm old, or once I pass 40, somehow I'm this. Um, you know, it's the simple things. It's, it's allowing myself to still have fun. It's not being freaked out when I get wrinkles. It's not wanting to just freeze my face so that I, I somehow look an age that I'm not. You know, I'm trying to grow in chronologically and trying <laughs> to be as much in the year that I am and not try to go backwards. Well, do you uh, work out? I do. I have recently had to stop working out for a few months and it's killed me because that is the thing. When I'm in a routine, um, I drink more water, right. I sleep better, yes. I drink less alcohol. Like right. It's sort of this whole thing. So yeah. you take away that and I think, oh, I'll have those french fries <laughs> or right. I'll have that extra no, whatever. It's so it's a, it's it's right. for, unfortunate when it, I have to do it all. Right, and right. then when I don't do one of them, sometimes I do that thing right. where I don't do any of it. But you watch, right? You watch what you eat. Yeah. I mean, I again, you know, as a mom with my kids, it's sort of, I have to live by example. Like, yes. I can't have chocolate for breakfast, right. which I would do. Right. I'd go and get a cup of coffee and a piece uh, of chocolate, and right. I'm fine. Right. That's not the example you right. want to set exactly. for your no, children. No, yeah, yeah. So uh, I definitely work out. I don't necessarily sleep enough, but when I do, I look younger. Yeah. And what's odd too is, <laughs> this is also something funny that I've realized lately. Um, the heavier I am, the younger I look. Oh yeah, So definitely. So when I put like 10 pounds on, people will be like, did you do something to your face? I know, well, I'm you, like, no, I'm just Fatty McFatterson. You know, like, you, that's what okay. Catherine Deneuve said. Yeah, it's either your face or your, yeah, your yeah. face or your derriere, she said. <laughs> After 40, it's your face or your derriere. So it does help. It's like natural plumper. Yeah, it is. It's absolutely. <laughs> this is from Olivia. You wrote a book about your postpartum depression and it sounds scary. What was the scariest time and why do you think such an important issue gets swept under the rug? Uh, I think that postpartum depression is one of those things where we don't want to admit that it's real. We've been told that it's the most natural thing in the world to have children and you have a child and you look down on your child and your world comes into focus and it is so far from being blissful and I think people need to admit that. That's the first part that's sort of the, the psychological aspect. There's a very strong biochemical thing that happens that we don't want to admit because we're ashamed of it. So it, it it needed to be talked about. The scariest part in the world for me was looking at my daughter and truly not feeling connected at all. Feeling I could just walk out the room, out of the room and never really come back and she'd probably be better off. Now, it is a dev all I've ever wanted is more children. I, since I was a child, I knew I wanted to be a mom. Then it happens and all of a sudden this devastating emotion overtakes you. And then to feel alienated from even the people who loved me the most. Right. So thankfully, I found the right doctors and I found the right combination of medicine and psychology. And to me, I found my my version of what I needed as a prescription right. Right. Of, in life. Um, people don't often know it's happening because the feelings are so real right. and they're custom made to each person. Right, right. You know, you the brilliant the, the the brilliant sort of nature of depression is that it's really smart and it picks it's perfectly designed for you oh. and it's perfectly designed oh, for me. So customized. you you're asking these negative you get asked these negative questions in your head and you come up with real answers. Right, right, right. You know, and so of course I shouldn't be a mother. Right, uh-huh. Uh -huh. Why why would I be? I'm not normal. I'm right. not, and whatever the answer is in your world, right. you know, in your life. And so I, I think it's just it's now coming to the forefront. I mean, I think my book was one of the first books to really shed light on it. It's and, great that you did it. I, I hope I hope everybody's listening to this because I, 
I know a lot of women have this uh, problem, and it must be very scary to think I'm the only woman in the world who ever had a baby and had this feeling. You feel you, you are know? the only yeah. one. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's so helpful, so helpful. It's also, you know, I think we have to look at it as if someone had diabetes, we would say, you know, take insulin, don't do right, this. Right, this right. is a, it's a biochem, your biochemistry right. is just out of whack. Right. And it, and that, your synapses are affected, right. your, I mean, hormonally, right. you, you do feel, and what, then we think, oh, we're crazy. And right. there's that label of crazy. Right. And then we think, well, being a mother shouldn't make me crazy. And right. those are the, those are the, the catchphrases right. that we have. And it's yeah. just, it's really embarrassing. Yeah, oh, I'm sure. You know, and I think that, and it's devastating. Right. And you just, and then, you know, then we just need to keep talking about it. You're so great, Brooke. <laughs> Thank really, you. you are. Thank I you. I mean, this is all about helping women, oh. this whole site, and the idea that you're so able to, to articulate it. Oh, Not just you. that you share it, but you really articulate it, and I'm sure it really thank is you. helping a lot of people. Thank you. Well, we yeah. have to help each other. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I mean, it's a... It does take a village, and we are all living in separate places, yes, so right. this, is, this is the village. <laughs> now, this is from Jolyn. What do you think we should do to keep our children safe in school? Did you discuss the Newton, <sighs> Newtown tragedy with your children? Did you, how did you explain I, it? I did. I discussed it with them, and there is a fine, fine line between telling it when your six-year-old asks you. Now, six. That was the average age, six and seven, of yeah. all these children. Right. Um, when she asks you, is that going to happen in my school? Right. You, I had to say no. Right. You don't, because they don't need to learn this, that lesson. Right, right. But we need to take enough of it to teach them not to talk to strangers, yeah. not to do, that's one thing, but to be sitting victim, yeah. and then you tell a six-year-old, yes, it could happen. Oh, no. You, you just, I mean, yes. I said, no, the answer is no, it will not. And right. that is why Walter is there at the front door. That is why the doors are locked. That's where there are bars on the windows. Right. That's why, and you try to keep them at least feeling safe. Right. I think it's, it's a combination, obviously, of gun control, but also dealing with mental mental health. Right. And we've now right. been hearing this brought up, but it right. is so true because we're seeing a pattern here and it's a deadly, deadly combination. Right. The combination of, of, of this mental health issue, which we just discussed about postpartum. Now that's a piece where then you read about, all we read about our mothers killing their kids. Right. And that's the only time we think that postpartum right, is right. worth discussing. Right, right. But it's, it has to start somewhere. Right. yes. You know, these, these issues start start and mothers and families need to have access to real help right. and education right and you I believe and again politically I'm not as articulate about this but to be able to nip it in the bud from that level right. and then also make it harder yeah and also for weapons you know, yes make it hard and also help people who are mentally ill to get the kind of treatment they need the kind of medication don't turn them out not don't just them putting away. them in jail yeah. and not just right. and yet and it, it's, it's it's tricky you know but as far as my kids you know I mean you keep an eye on them you keep them aware but there's just so much you right. can do That's you right. know are we not are we supposed to homeschool not if children? somebody no. invades a school um, this is from Stacy some people say they turned 40 and never felt better what are your thoughts on life after 40? This is a big question because our community is over 35, so they need to know this. I, I, I can't say physically I felt better from 40 on. Um, you know, now I'm, I'm hearing words like arthritis, <laughs> I'm hear, you know, tendonitis, all these things that sounded like old people That's things right. from when I was a kid. And now I have a little bit of all of them. <laughs> and so physically, but... Mentally and emotionally, I have felt so much more in my skin since I've turned 40. And just just the, that feeling of, this is who I am, right. and I'm going to live out. Hopefully, there's another <laughs> half to go. But um, So I had, think I've felt better emotionally more than physically, but then that has helped be... I've been more comfortable with what I look like. Right. Yeah, that's <laughs> and great. then, you know, my aches and pains, I just sort of think, okay, this is a part <laughs> of it. I'm not going to let it beat me. But so it's kind of twofold. <laughs> I'm happier since I'm 40, <laughs> but I'm walking like this all day. <laughs> this is from Anne. What's one thing couples can do to stay connected to the craziness of balancing work and family, et cetera? What, uh, what just the concept of talking to each right, other. Right, right, right. I find that my husband and I get into this. Um, the, this 
place where we're just, okay, this is this time and this time and then we'll do that and we'll go there and we'll pick up the kids and I'll get the kids and we'll do this and then we've got that thing, but I've got to be over there at this time, so why don't I just meet you? And you've not even sat down to say, right. how are you today? I know, I know. And yeah. it's easy not I to, because when you, when you first meet someone and you're falling in love, it's all about learning about the other person and that's addictive too. Right. And that's what you fall in love with is being known right. to another person. Yes, and learning. They from, know me, yeah. they get me. Right. And after all the business starts you realize you're, you're not getting to know the other person anymore. Right. How you long think, have you been married? I've been married uh, 11 years. Oh great. And both mm -hmm. of these children are with this Yes, husband? yes. Oh that's great, that's great. And how is he at, uh, uh, with the kids? I mean is he a, a involved dad? He's very involved. He um, He's definitely the pushover and uh, I'm definitely the you know the authoritative. The enforcer. The enforcer. <laughs> but I've thrown him the torch a couple times. I've been like, you do deal with this one. Right, right. You know, and I watch him just because they're his little girls, you oh, know, yeah. and they just, of they just wrap <laughs> and wrap him tighter and wrap him tighter right. and then just go flick. <laughs> and he's like, oh. <laughs> so, That's but he's great. good and he's he's a very good, a good dad. That's great. This is from Trudy. Hi, Trudy. Hi, Trudy. Hi, Brooke. Did you make any New Year's resolutions this year? Oh, um, yeah, I, I to be, a, uh, my New Year's resolution, has been to um, definitely be less focused on the things that I don't like in my life and totally focus on the things that I do. Um, and that means like being more giving, but in little ways, you know, little yeah. teeny ways with people like every day, sort of that, that wanting to be kind, but whether it's, I'm going to get a cup of coffee and asking the, security guard if he wants one right, or right. You know, something that's just a little teeny yes. kindness throughout the days that don't get recognized. Yeah. <laughs> but I just got to say it on television. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's true. Little pieces yeah. of, your, of kindness, are, are, it's everything. And not, it's not about, it's not all about me and my, yeah, right. my how my day is. Right. It's like, it's really not all about me. Right. No, I, that, no that, that's great. Um, so this is from Stephen. You've been in the public eye your whole life. Is there anything about you that you think people would really surprised, be surprised by? I think people, because they've grown up with me to a certain extent, Stephen, um, I don't know how old you are, but uh, feel like um, th there's a there's sort of an America's sweetheart yes. kind of a thing that right. has been labeled. I've been labeled that, and I think that whenever I do something a little off color or my Mine's in the gutter a little bit, or I do some comedy stuff. Well, you're a lot funnier than just... I expected. You are. <laughs> I'm a little, I'm New York, you know. I yeah. was born and raised in Manhattan, and I think whenever my New York comes out, which is usually all the time, um, and it's not just an anger, it's just an everything. Right. Um, I think people are surprised because I think they think that I'm somehow untouchable or right. pristine or something. Yeah, and once I, know. I, my real, and my mom's, nice. my mom is from Newark, and, oh, yeah. you know, so. <laughs> Yeah, no, you have a bodiness about you that's adorable. I love it. <laughs> Body, uh, I love that uh, word. It is a great word. And you can say body, too. Yeah. <laughs> about that, you can say body. Uh, but Tina wants to know what you think is the sexiest thing about your husband. Ooh, ooh that's good. <laughs> um, he just loves, like, my womanliness. Like, he loves oh, me great. as a woman. Oh, like, oh, he's great. not, he's just... He's, whether I'm 10 pounds heavier or, or, or really, really fit or tired or whatever, he's just got this kind of like, oh, about him. And it's, oh, it's a real, nice. it makes, gives me so much more confidence. Oh, that's great. And, and, yeah. and it helps you celebrate. Like he just celebrates. And he never, he's, he's smart too. <laughs> You'll say, you know, do I, do I look fat? Do I look fat in these pants? Okay, well, I'm going to walk away. Now look at my, look at my butt and tell me if, if I look fat in these pants. And it's, he won't ever answer. <laughs> He'll say, Come on, you know I love your butt. Uh, He's like, why? He goes, how can oh I? Dear. How can I negate it? He goes, I love it. There's nothing. Because I think it's perfect. Uh, he goes, you want me to say something so that oh, then you can feel so bad great. about yourself? He's that's like, I can't great. do that. So it's um, that's it's a great. good lesson to that's learn great. For, that's great. for men. Don't ever say what you really feel, but be really careful. Yeah, be careful. <laughs> Whenever I say to Phil, oh God, look at this, look at this, look at this, he always says to me, every woman in America wants to look like you. Now that isn't true. Oh, it but is. it's so great to have your husband say, what are you talking about? Everybody wants to look like you. They, well, they mean it. So sweet. And so they mean sweet. it. That's the important part. Okay, now let's see. What Michelle wants to know, what do you do to stay fit? 
and what's a typical day of eating? So a typical day, we kind of know what you do to stay fit. You do right. work out, right? I work out. I spin and I take yoga. Um, I do yoga. I take yoga. I take it somewhere and, and <laughs> don't do anything with it. Um, a typical I, day of eating, do you really watch I what you really eat? I really try. No, I have been on a bad sort of slant where I won't eat. And then I said, I'll have, you know, I'll finish what my daughters eat and then I won't have a meal and then I'll have maybe one meal or I'll drink a beer and then won't be hungry right. and then go to bed. Like it's just completely wrong. And it's been a few months of just sort of not treating myself very well. But when I'm doing the right thing, I make sure that I have the three meals a day, right. but small yeah. and make sure that I drink a lot of water. Yeah. I have to be better at taking vitamins. Right. I'm I not. Know. Um, I eat five meals. I mean, I eat three yeah, big meals and then little like snacks. Like nuts and raisins and stuff. If I don't, I, if stuff. I don't then, I'm just, then I eat a candy bar. Um, yeah. This woman is asking a question that I think you answered, but in case there's anything else she should know. This is from Natalie. Brooke, I'm a big fan of yours. I just had a baby and I've been feeling really off. How did you know that you were suffering from postpartum depression? after the birth of your daughter. So what, which... I, well, I didn't know. I think that's the scariest part uh -huh. is that, first of all, you know, better be, better be safe than sorry. And uh, there are, they are screening much more now. Um, you know, when you have a baby, you go to the hospital or the doctor more times than you ever do in, in succession, like weekly for your baby. But they very rarely ask the parent, the mom, how she's feeling. Um, or when you say, oh, I'm okay, they say, oh, it's the baby blues, it'll pass. I so see. that, it doesn't help you become informed. I did not know. But when I started feeling really dark, um, I would go into the shower and just cry. And I would, and it lasted past the first week that they say, your hormones are going to be out of whack the first week. Um, so that was the first thing. It went much longer than that. And by the time it was, I was three weeks in, I thought, this can't be, right. this can't, there's something can't be right because it, but so I did still you didn't ask know. For, did you ask to speak to a doctor? I went to my doctor and uh -huh. his first reaction was, you'll get over it. Believe uh -huh. me, and uh -huh. all moms feel this. You're overwhelmed. It's your first baby. You know, you're isolated. You're fat. You're all these, he's like, you'll get over it. He then called me back that night, and his wife is a, was a nurse practitioner, and she, he must have said something to her. And she said to him, no, you call her back and you tell her she doesn't have to feel that way. Oh, that's great. That there's a combination of things that she can do. Let's, let's run through. And they have now questionnaires. Oh, you know, great. Do you feel like once you leave the house, you want to okay, stay good. out of the house? Oh, you know, cool. All right, so then, it's important so to ask. Then this woman could ask and just I would say, ask, see the, find this questionnaire? Yes, I would ask your doctor. I would ask um, a nurse practitioner. Um, people are now starting to talk about it more. There are books to read that it, you'll start to s see that you are experiencing some of the same feelings. Um, and then you realize, oh, that's what that is. There's this feeling of helplessness and fear. And I mean, I had even, it got to the point where I saw terrible things happen to my daughter in like a vision and I didn't want to do it. But you have fear, you, you have fears you have of it, fears of it. Yeah. and they're really acute fears. Right. Or you just feel useless, or you feel like you've made a huge mistake because you're right. never going to sleep again. And right, right. All of those are are there's there's no truth to that, but there there is help. But to, this is a common thing, so it, you aren't the only one, and there seven and out of ten women who wow. experience it. Wow. And it goes. The problem is, it goes from postpartum depression to postpartum psychosis and within that gamut there are different right. different levels of it yeah. and we only really read about what's the postpartum. What's a good book to read about it if somebody wanted to pick it up, do you know? You know, I mean <laughs> for an empathetic look, if my book is really easy to, I'm not trying to sell my no. book, but I'm saying it's a, there's or if someone has it, borrow it. Um, but to, to understand, to realize that you're not the only one. Right. There are now many more from doctors that uh -huh. are giving the clinical. I think I needed to hear the clinical side, right. and I wished somebody had written a book like I did because then I would feel not so alone. And what is the name of your book? It's called Down Came the Rain. Oh, Down Came the Rain. So, okay, well, that's a help. I'm sure you still can buy it, but I wasn't not trying no, to sell no, my book. I'm, I'm just one, saying, read I'm it online or something. Ask. I'm no, not. Because <laughs> we, all, we need to pass along information. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a, a question. Um, I didn't realize you just lost your mother. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry. Well, this is from Eliza, and she says, I, I too take care of an elderly mother. How did you personally handle the big changes in face of dementia or Alzheimer's? Alzheimer's. I'm struggling with the ups and downs of this in my home. 
Uh, do you want to answer this? Or would sure, you to... I, I will. What's her name? Or, um, uh, Liza. Liza. Um, it, there's no, nobody can prepare you for it. Um, I think you have to first be really honest about what your expectations are um, and what you, what you want from your mother. And if there is something to say, say it to her while she has a cognitive sense about her, you know, where, where her abilities are still there because the decline can be very rapid. It can also take years. Um, it's, it is horrible to witness. Mm. Um, I knew I needed to see it so that I could at least be present mm. in it. Um, but no matter how much homework you do and no matter how much you say or do, no one would really be able to prepare you for the moment when they take their last breath. But if you can do whatever you can in being there to the best of your ability for you, right. um, it's because there's guilt that happens. I'm just in the process of beginning to deal with it. So I don't really, I have not on the out, at the other end of it, so yeah. my I'm less able to educate right, because right. I'm still in it. Right. Um, but you came through it. But I came <laughs> through it so That's far. It's only been about a month, but oh, it's wow. um, I didn't realize it, that. yeah. So you you just have to. Um, it it's not personal, although it feels incredibly personal. Right, right. I think because yeah. the things that they say, it's um, their brain is not functioning um, in a normal right. capacity. Um, we're almost out of time, but I wanted to just see. Um, Mary Jo wants to know, what's an important part of parenting to you? Oh God, patience, which mm -hmm. I have, I struggle with. Um, <laughs> I feel that the most important thing that I've learned from living with these little people <laughs> is that um, patience, but honesty. Uh -huh. Demanding honesty of them, but right. showing them that, you know, I will sit down and I'll say, you know, you have to help me with this. I don't understand, are you happy when you're sassy to me? Does uh -huh. it make you feel good? And my older one said, well, the punishment doesn't. And I said, okay, but what <laughs> does? And she goes, it's like I get to push you back. And I said, okay. That's great. That I can deal with that. that. Yeah. Let's deal with that. You want to, and that's, that's natural. Right, right. But instead, what we do is we want to fight right, right, because right. We're, we right. want to fight them. I mean, right, I right, want to fight right. her from morning till night. That's but, great. So she... That's great that she's that honest. She's that honest. And you also, you know, a tug of war only works with two people. Right, tugging. right. So right. I, I just try to be really, really honest when she hurts my feelings. Right. Really honest when I'm proud of her. Really honest when I'm disappointed in her right. behavior, right. never who she is, but her behavior. Right. Yeah. She recently just said she was going to tell on, my, on her sister, and it was something very embarrassing to her sister. And I said, if I find out that you have told anybody, she said, what are you going to do, take something away from me, like in a sassy way? And I said, you know what, no, I'm not. But if you tell anybody, I will know you are not a kind person. Oh, wow. And she just went. That's because good. all they want is their mother's approval. Right. Now they want attention and they want to push you right. until you want to wring their neck. Right, right. However, she looked at me and I said, and I know for a fact that you're a good human being. But if you do something like that, that's the message that I'm going to get. Oh, Instead wow. of I'll take your eye touch right. or whatever. Right, thing, because right. they don't seem to care the, the about... The worst thing that my father would say to me is, is I'm very, very disappointed, disappointed. in you. My mother used to say, it'd be better if you beat her to death. I mean, yeah. you've, you've just crushed her. I, I just, I couldn't handle disappointing him. It's primal. Yeah. And I, so I think that, you know, just really demanding honesty from them, but being willing to, right. and it's hard because you want to say, yes, you can watch a movie after dinner. <laughs> You know, and then sure, it's 7.30 and they shouldn't, right. and, you know, and they've got right. to go to bed. And then you said, you told oh, me. Oh, I, I, I know, I know. And they're I always know. catching you in like little lies <laughs> and you don't really mean them to be lies. But I'll say, if there's time, and you've done all the things you need to do. Yes, you, but you have to stop yourself and say the thing because they're like oh, I little, know. Oh, they're little prosecutors. They're, yeah, they're, they're little <laughs> reporters. Um, <laughs> one last question. Marianne wants to know, who is or was your greatest positive mentor? Oh, you know, I in in life with regards to treatment of other people, it was my mom. You know, she just she made me so accountable and taught me accountability to other people's feelings and kindness and you know I, manners and all of that so that helped me it helps you get through life if you are kind and nice right you, it's easier right um 
so that was a thing. And then I had a, a university professor who has since passed away, and he was one of the first people to ever really ask me what my thoughts about something were. Uh -huh. I was used to taking other people's thoughts and then expanding them right, or right. talking about them. Right, or, right. Well, so and so said this, and I think you know maybe they're right. Or, right, right. And he was the first person to not let me listen to anybody else's opinion and ask me first what my what I thought. And That's when I right. said I don't know, he said, "Well, you underline your books, don't you?" And I said, yes. He said, does someone stand behind you and tell you what part to underline? How smart. He goes, well, what do you underline? I said, well, I underline the important parts. <laughs> he said, oh, why don't you tell me one of your important parts? Oh, that's and then, good. And I thought there was a freedom in actually right. being okay with having my own opinion. That's great. That was a big... How smart of him. He was... He was just that really was very brilliant. Lucky. He was an educator. Yeah. A true, a that true was very educator. Lucky. Well, yeah. thank you, Brooke. You're wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing everything with us. Thank You're you. You're so thank honest. Thank you to all of you. Thank you, everybody. Have a happy holiday, and I'll see you next time.